Data Skeptic mini episodes provide high level descriptions of key concepts related to data science and skepticism. Today's topic is Goodhart's Law. We're going to borrow a bit from economics in this episode, Linda, but it's a concept that's very useful to data scientists. There's this idea called Goodhart's Law, which states when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Off the bat, do you have any interpretation of what that means? Well, to me, it sounds like when something tries to be something that it's not, it's obviously doing a bad job of its its original intent. That's uh, very much along the right lines. There are these classic examples of the, the what's called the cobra effect and also the rat effect. I, I don't know if these are true stories. In Vietnam, the government wanted to get rid of rats. So they wanted to pay people for killing rats. It's kind of like they crowdsourced the work, right? Okay. They didn't want to just like have people bring a bunch of dead rats to the official place. So they said, just chop off the tail and bring us the tail and we'll pay you for the rat. And then they found that not only did the police notice there were a lot of tailless rats running around, but people started breeding rats to chop off their tails to get the money. (laughs) And then in the cobra effect, which supposedly happened in India, same idea. They were going to pay people to kill snakes. So people started breeding the snakes. And as soon as they found this out, they ended the program. And then the people just released all the snakes. (laughs) And there were more snakes than they started with. Wow. I don't know if it's true, but it's it's a kind of funny uh, fairy tale or whatever. Well, I imagine it is easier to breed rats than to kill them. You'd assume so, right? Yeah. What was the flaw in both of those stories? Well, I think they weren't counting the actual number that they wanted. They paid them to do something that wasn't 100% provable, that uh-huh. it was like being done the way the government thought it would be yeah. done. Yeah, sounded like a pretty good idea at the start, right? Yeah, but then you're like, wait, it's easier to breed them and bring the tail in than to actually kill them. Yeah, so it backfired kind of. Now, there's another version of Campbell's Law, and this one's a little bit more social science I should read it for people to know. It's the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision-making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt social processes it is intended to monitor. Maybe this could be an example like, we're, you know, the government's going to give out more street sweeping money depending on which streets are the dirtiest. So on the day of the inspection, people go and put a bunch of garbage in the street so that their community can get the money, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, how would you define Campbell's Law in layperson's terms? Yeah, I guess I would say it's when you're so heavily focused on optimizing one metric or KPI that you it ceases to become the right KPI. People start manipulating it. Okay. Don't ask me what a KPI is. Oh, I know what it is. It is a <laughs> key performance indicator. Oh, good job, Linda. Well, tell me what you know about KPIs. Well, at work, we use them. Uh Uh-huh, how so? (laughs) We just define them, you know, at the beginning of a project. Mm -hmm. How do we want to measure success? You know, whether it's number of subscriptions Mm -hmm. or number of the profits or number of products sold. It's important to measure, but then obviously if you only measure that, you know, and not the other things. Yeah. That it's not. I also think some things aren't measurable, so. (laughs) Like what? If you think the website looks good, for example, (laughs) if it's, you know, you could give someone an opinion, it's an opinion-based thing, you can measure it, but I mean, it's going to be really across the board. What if you measure the click-through rate or the time on page or something like that? Yeah, but it doesn't mean you like the look of the page. Well, you're saying that like in an A-B test that the group that performed to the highest metric of your KPI, they seem to like the page more by that measure anyway. Well, it meant they bought whatever, whatever more. Right. But it doesn't mean they like the look of the page or they walked away being like, that's a really great website. Yeah, that's true. And this is actually why I wanted to bring this up because I think I see this happening in companies a lot that if you you can get a a pretty good but not perfect KPI and if you over-optimize it for it, um, there's this expression, if you improve a product enough, you'll eventually break it. And I think that I, I see that happening all around me all the time when I uh, look at websites and things like that. Another example might be like a call center. The logical thing there would be to reduce the amount of time that people spend on the call, right? Because it costs you money for every minute someone's on the phone because that's a person that you have to pay to do that. So you'd like them to get really short phone calls by maybe having a good script and a good menu system and stuff like that. But it also might just encourage the employees to quick hang up on people or not help them. Yeah, maybe it's just 
a lot of dropped calls. <laughs> Do you have any recent experience that's uh, similar to that? I don't know about call centers, but since we were buying our house, yeah. we had to confirm my employment mm -hmm. that I worked for the company that I work for. Right. And so, LinkedIn wasn't good enough. Your W-2 wasn't good enough. Yeah, the latest pay stub wasn't good Not enough. Not good enough. They had to call a number, and it had to be a specific number that was listed. Which is really hard for startups. Like, I don't know yeah. what my company doesn't have Startups a don't really have list that many listed numbers. No, I use because them regularly. Well. they're just not very organized. Yeah. They're just like, whatever. If you want to call me, call my cell. Uh -huh. <laughs> And so they had to go back and forth. And the people who were verifying my employment kept saying, oh, we haven't verified it. But then my HR person kept saying, like, it's verified. I called them. And it was just, it was back and forth. And also they couldn't find my name because my name is spelled funny. So it was a lot of work. And your HR person went above and beyond. And she called them back. And, was, and what happened? Yeah, she called them back. She like brainstormed different ways to spell my name, to find me. And the lady hung up on her a couple of times. Well, right? no, the lady was about to hang up on her because she was like, the other person was like, oh, we don't have this person on record. And she's like, no, 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 this is very, very important. Yeah. You need to find her. <laughs> it seems like maybe her boss is measuring her by how many, how quickly she can end a phone call or how many units she can process in a day, which doesn't always mean, you know, good quality then of, of doing her job. Maybe that was good heart's law in action right there. Yeah. Perhaps a better example, though, might be search engine optimization. Do you know how Google ranks websites? I think you mentioned it earlier, but I forget. So a long time ago, actually, this is a, a great little segue here. We talked about the PageRank algorithm. And that uh, there's a mini episode on that people can go check out. It's the major innovation that Google brought when they started their search engine. It's that they were going to rank, essentially rank websites based on the incoming links to them and the credibility of those links, rather than like how many keywords are on a page. Do you remember back in like the early to mid 90s, what uh, search engine results were like? Yeah, I mean, if you're only ranking how many links, people just kept making websites that link to each other. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the problem with page rank. So people would make these link farms and they would just create random websites and, and send a bunch of links in certain directions. And so people started to manipulate page rank as soon as they you know, announced how they were doing it. And then they invented trust rank. And uh, I guess page rank and trust rank are still around, but they account for... I want to say I, I saw a Google engineer say something like a third of, of the weight of a ranking and there are other things in place now. So they have to kind of keep it secret because Goodhart's law is in place. As soon as there's a process or an algorithm for how you rank highly in the search engine, people are trying to manipulate it. So Google originally noticed this interesting thing like, oh, a site with a lot of incoming links, that's a good website, right? Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it sounds it like it's intuitive. But then as soon as they used it for something that is to rank, people started manipulating it and it stopped being useful. Or not entirely stopped being useful, but they, uh, they keep the Google engineers uh, busy at work, I guess. Yeah, it wasn't as trustworthy. Goodhart's Law is something one should always look out for. So a lot of data science is about picking a particular metric or KPI and optimizing for it. And as soon as you've picked it and start optimizing for it, there's a chance you might be affecting or changing the way people uh, behave, which could then change the usefulness of that thing you're measuring. Uh, maybe we could talk about Agile. Do you do Agile at your job? Uh, we do a blend of it. <laughs> yeah. That, that I think is probably what's best. Why is yours a blend? I don't think we as a company <laughs> are as strict that we can implement Agile to a T. Yeah, you should implement what's right for you. Yeah. I mean, I've seen Agile and Scrum rolled out really well at companies, and I've seen other places where it actually hurts the company and makes them less productive. Like it can introduce this bias towards very short-sighted goals and never long-term goals, or people just putting arbitrary part one, part two on things and, and just trying to optimize for these story points. But the story points, getting a lot of those isn't necessarily the same thing as moving the business forward. Yeah, I mean, some things really need to be accomplished with like really big projects. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm sure you could break it down into little steps. But even then, I feel like people don't think of big, really yeah. game changing projects no. as itty bitty steps. Like they really have to think about it. Right. And that really depends on your leadership yep. being able to change that perception. Very true. Well, anyway, thank you as always for joining me, Linda. 
Thank you, Kyle. And until next time, I want to remind everyone. Oh, yeah. We didn't do any real formal announcement here. So we got our house. It's all confirmed now. We're yes. still at our old house. Uh, but the new Data Skeptic Studios are under construction. So uh, one or two more minis and we should be in there recording formally. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. You won't hear Yoshi squawking in the background. <laughs> or the slightly echoey sound of our dining room. Well, I think our dining room is lovely. So everyone's missing out on this lovely romantic atmosphere. As I suppose that's true. But uh, they've got maybe one or two more sessions of it. So until next time. <laughs> until next time. Yeah, I want to remind everyone to keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Good night, Linda. Good night. For more on this episode, visit dataskeptic.com. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher.